Oh, jeez. All the great things that are happening at HC. Hold on, wait. Like, that's a good word. That's a positive, reinforcing word. All the great things that are going to happen here at HD Church. And I was like, <laughs> well, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited for, for everything. I'm excited for all the new. Don't you guys like new? Yeah. I like new. Um, I'm excited for it, and I know God is. I, you know, when Pastor Kathy was talking about um, just God's faithfulness and your faithfulness, church, uh, during the time when we were shut down, like, I wanted to cry. I like I I'm not gonna do it right now because I'm gonna hold things together, but I did, I did. You, you don't understand. There was a ton of fear that began to creep in. You, like I don't know, right? We don't know. No idea. We're in murky waters. It's uncertain, and I know we're still there. I know there's a lot going on. And like Pastor Kathy said, man, I, I, I every once in a while I'll swipe left on my phone and I'll see all the latest news and I'll look at some of the headlines and man, I don't even want to click on it. I don't want to go down the rabbit holes and I don't want to read all the different thoughts from all the different parties and everything going on. I don't even, it's whatever, all right? We're here. We got to do our best. That's it, right? You got to make your choices as best as you can, um, hopefully by the grace and wisdom of God and, and listen and keep moving forward. We just got out of a series where we were talking about how we got to be more bold and confident in our faith and sharing our faith and loving others and preaching the gospel and pointing people to Jesus. The only answer out of what we're going through is, let me just say this, the only answer out of anything we ever go through is Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. And so as long as we can keep that at the forefront of our minds, I promise you, you'll be okay no matter what you face. And so I'm excited. We are, we are, we are going to enter into a new series this month, um, a three-part series, and we'll have our special guest come um, at the end of the month, so be prepared to receive uh, from him, from the man of God. But I, I, listen, I'm just going to get right into it. You guys ready? Yeah. I know you guys are ready. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, out of the NRV. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of context behind what's going on. God is, God is just creating. That's who God is. He's the creator. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's the creator of this world. He's the creator of everything that, that we see on this earth. You ever been somewhere and just wonder how things got to where they were? That's God. That's God. We drive through, you drive through Yosemite. You drive up in the mountains. You see all the giant rocks. You, dr you ever been you know, flying in a plane and you're beginning to descend and there's water beneath you? Like, man, how did all these things get here? That's God. In the beginning, God was creating everything. And, and as he's creating everything, everything is, is really good, the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 31 says this. It says, God saw everything he had made, and it was very good. Can you say, I like good? I like good. It was very good. There was evening and there was morning. It was day six. The Bible goes on to say that, that on the seventh day, Man, God pretty much finished everything up, and he rested. But we all know what happens in Genesis 3. Everything just goes to kaputs. I mean, the enemy comes in and begins to tempt and distract God's creation of humanity between Adam and Eve and the fall of men. Uh, man begins to happen, and sin enters the earth. So let me just say something. Before sin entered the earth, you and I were created to be good. God created us to, to reign and rule over this earth and everything that he created in it. We were special. And then man fell, and sin entered in, and we became damaged. And we talk about this a lot. It's pretty evident how this works out in our lives. And the greatest example that we can see is in our children. It, like, like we've talked about it before. Nobody teaches, no parent in here teaches their kid to be selfish. No kid in here teaches their kid to be greedy and to be mean. It's just natural, right? Right? Like, I have a three-year-old. She's a blessing. 
But at times, she's the daughter of Eve. <laughs> One preacher called them vipers and diapers. <laughs> but, but it's true, right? Like, like, I'm not there saying, now listen, man, when you get those toys, those are your toys. You don't ever share those toys with no one. Those are just yours. When you get that, that candy, that popcorn, that snack, you don't share that snack with anybody. That belongs to you. Never share. I, what parent, none, ever, has ever taught their kids to be like that? Just natural. Listen. Because sin entered the earth and this world, and we became damaged. Now, the good part that we all know is that God came in and gave us an answer. He gave us the solution in the form of a person named Jesus Christ. And that is what is able to take what has been damaged and turn it into good, not because we are good, but, but of course because God is good. So if we're going to continue to operate and move and walk through this life um, as followers of Jesus, we have to understand a few things. And listen, you're going to have to hang in there with me this morning, okay? Number one is this, okay? We talk about it in church growing up. You've been in church for long enough. You're going to hear this phrase, the devil is a liar. The enemy is a liar. You have an enemy. And you know, I hate to say this, but you know the truth about your enemy, your adversary, the devil who hates God, who's opposed to God? You know the truth about him is that he's not dumb. He's not dumb. Like the enemy doesn't come to you and, and, and just, you know, tempt you or, or, or try you or put thoughts that you know are completely wrong and you're going to reject. No, he tries to swindle you. He's crafty. He tries to trick you the way he tricked Eve into falling into the temptation that she fell into. He's, he's not dumb in it. The devil is a liar. He's not dumb. But listen, but listen, but we don't have to believe him. In John 8, towards the end of that, that verse, you don't have to go there, but towards the end of John 8, the scripture calls Satan, the devil, that he is the father of lies. And if there's anything that the enemy is going to try to do to you, my brother and sister, is the enemy will always try to get you to believe that you can never follow Jesus the way God wants you to follow Jesus. <laughs> my, wife had a, my wife had a bad dream yesterday morning. And she woke up at 3.41 a.m. and she said that in her dream she was just beating me up. She was just telling me off and beating me up. Now, listen. See, look, look. You got to understand something. I'm smart now, okay? I've been in this for six years. I know it's not that long. I know it's amateur hour for a lot of you guys. I know. Where's Lawrence and Dorothy? Did they show up today? They've been, they've been married for, we already know, uh, 180 years. They've just been going at it for a long time. But listen, I know six years is not a lot, but I already learned. I didn't even ask what the dream was about because I already knew it wasn't good. She's like, I had a bad dream. I woke up at 3.41 a.m. Her alarm goes off at 3.50 a.m., so she lost out on that nine minutes of sleep. That's the snooze time right there, man. That counts. That's important. And so she lost out on that sleep. She said, I woke up. I was so mad at you, and I was beating you up in my dream. And I'm just listening. I'm not saying nothing. I don't know what the, I don't want to know what the dream was about. I don't want to know what happened. All I know is I did something wrong in the dream, and she wants to beat me up, or she was beating me up over. So I just, I just completely just said, man, uh, that's terrible. And I go, man, the devil's a liar. And that's what I told her. And she's all, and that's what I was saying, boo. I was driving on my way to work. So I'm like, you're a liar, devil. You're a Satan. You're a liar. You're not going to come into my mind and have those thoughts about my husband, whatever, 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 right? I don't know what the dream was about. Maybe, I think maybe she was probably dreaming that I left her for Katy Perry. That's like, <laughs> if you don't know the Katy Perry story, you haven't been here long enough. I see, Cameron's like, I love that story. <laughs> it's a true story. You guys know her real name is not Katy Perry. It's Kate Hudson. Her mom, is, her mom and dad, um, her, her dad is Pastor Keith Hudson from Santa Barbara, California, who were friends with my mom and dad while we were growing up here at church. Pastor Keith would come down and preach and bring his family and bring Katy down. 
and we ran into, this is all a true story. We ran into Pastor Keith at a youth camp. His wife was doing a women's retreat, and we ran into him, and they were asking where we were from, and I, was, I wasn't there yet, and they asked some of our friends from Visalia um, where we were from, and they, we, they said, well, we're with the church from Delano, and we're from Visalia. Delano? I know, I know a pastor there, Pastor Juan, and this is after my dad had passed away, and they said, okay, then you know his son Eric? He said, yeah, I know Eric. Is he here? Man, I walk in there, and I see Keith Hudson. I'm like, oh, my God, your daughter's Katy Perry now. And so I'm like, I'm like, hey, Pastor Keith, he's all, hey, Pastor Eric, or not Pastor Eric, but hey, Eric, how are you, man? Man, I haven't seen you in a long time, blah, 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 blah. He goes, can I come say hi to your youth? And I'm like, come on, come say hi to him. So he comes in, and he's like, you guys don't know who I am, but you might know who my daughter is. And he says, my daughter's Katy Perry. And all the kids don't even believe it at first. But then they figure out he's telling the truth. And they're like, oh, my gosh. And so he goes on to tell the kids, true story. He goes, you guys don't know this, but my daughter had the biggest crush on Eric when she was little. And I'm like, dude, why are you telling me this right now? It's already over, man. It's already... I'm sorry, Jess. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So I think that's what my wife's dream was about. I, that's what I was thinking of, but I didn't say nothing. My girls still tease her. My, both my girls tease her. Mom, maybe it's Katy Perry. And so, I, listen, listen to me, listen to me. You have to understand that while you're on this journey with Jesus, the enemy is going to come in and lie to you about all kinds of things about your past, about your life, about your failures, about your mistakes, about things that happen. Man, he, I, you, I, you think I'm joking, but he'll come to you in dreams. He'll come to you in thoughts. He'll try to tell you things, all kinds of crazy things. You're not going to make it. You're going to die. You're going to get sick, the pandemic, all these different things going on. And he'll come in and try to lie to you and tell you that it, it's not going to work out. Whatever it is, you guys are, you already know what I'm talking about. But you need to understand that the devil is a liar. The Bible says in John 10 that the thief has only one thing in mind out of the Passion Translation. The thief only has one thing in mind. The enemy, he wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But listen, Jesus says, but I've come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. You see, that's what I want. Now, listen, I know you got to understand something. You're, you're talking to someone that knows that he used to be damaged goods. You're talking to someone, hear, hear me out. You're talking to someone that still at times, that still sometimes feels like they're damaged goods. Now, you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to feel like you've, you've, you've failed, you've messed up, it didn't work out, you've been through relationships, you've been through marriages, you didn't do well as a parent. All these different things are going on in your mind, and you know what it feels like to feel like a failure. But when you are in Christ, Amen. let me say that one more time. But when you are in Christ, Amen. but for the grace of God, for the mercy of Jesus that has come upon us, we do not have to believe the lies of the enemy. He is the father of lies. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus comes in to give us life, to give us life in abundance, more than we ever could ever expect. The moment, church, you stop allowing the lies from yourself, the world, and the devil, the moment you stop that, is the moment your life can truly begin to change. And this is something that we have to learn to walk in. I got to reject. I got to resist. I got to cast down the thoughts of the enemy. I feel, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir right now because you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys know what it's like when the enemy comes to creep in your mind and start to tell you all kinds of crazy things and, 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 and you know what it's like to dwell on those thoughts and allow the enemy to continue. No, 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 no. You got to say, no, devil, you're a liar. That's not who I am anymore. I don't receive that. I don't believe that. I receive what God's word says, what God has for me. And I choose to walk and believe that, not your lies. Number two, change your truth. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse, verses 31 and 32 out of the 
NLT, the New Living Translation, Jesus speaking, the Bible says in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said to the people who believed in him. Now, now, listen. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, do you believe in Jesus? It's okay. If if you don't really, we're going to get there. Don't worry about it. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. Now, we know this, right? All of us, I would say not all of us, the majority of us in here know that if we're going to change, that we got to remain faithful to what Jesus teaches, that we got to follow it, that we got to live it out, that we got to apply it to our lives. It's not good enough for just for us to just hear the word of God. We know that. We have to do what the word of God says. Jesus says, if you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings. Listen, he says this. He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, there's freedom in Jesus. I know that. But the freedom only comes when we choose to believe and follow and live out what Jesus teaches. Now, now hear me out, church. I know at times we feel like we're damaged goods. I know at times we might even be damaged goods, right? We're trying to walk this out. There's not one of us in here that every single day of our lives, we're the perfect Christian. We're the perfect follower of Jesus. Man, we got it all together. We say the right things. We do the right things. It doesn't happen that way. But I know what we've done in our lives. And this is, how, this is what we have to do to change it. Because the truth is, is that we all have our own truths about ourselves. What we think, what we say, who we are, what we do, how we live, right? Like you, you all believe certain things about yourself even when they don't line up with God's word. So in order for you to be set free, you have to change your truth because your truth, if it doesn't line up with God's word, That's not God's truth. That's your truth. And in order to be set free, you have to change your truth to line it up with what God says about you. Not what you think about you. Not what your past says about you. Not what your mistakes say about you. Not where you missed it or messed up. But what the word of God says. So in order to do this, we have to be faithful to the teachings of what Jesus says. To the commands. To how he calls us to follow him. Like, I t- like, I'll give you a perfect example. Like, at times, I still struggle with my truth because I try to make it my truth. Like, I still look at my life, and I still look at myself, and I think of how flawed I am. I think of how damaged. Is that still up there, damaged goods? I think of how damaged I am. I think of all the things that I've done wrong in my life. You, you're tracking with me, Right? Like I start counting all the things that I've done wrong in my life leading up to where I am today. And I don't feel like I deserve to be where I am today. I know that God, God's grace has carried me to where I am today. I know that a part of it has been me following Jesus and doing my best to follow the word of God. But I know at times that I build my own truth on my mistakes. And so what happens in this is that, listen, I'm not walking or operating in freedom when I do this. When I, when I begin to tell myself that I'm not good enough, that I don't deserve this, I don't deserve to be here, I don't deserve your grace, I don't deserve the blessing, Lord, that you put upon my life, I don't deserve to have what I have. Lord, have you looked at my life in the past decade, in the past 20 years? Have you looked at my life? Let me just tell you something. I know where my life went wrong. I was 14 years old. 14 years old. I know that. I know where I begin to go in the wrong direction. I was a freshman in high school, and I started to do things the wrong way. I started to live my life the wrong way. And I can go into this whole spiel for you, but I'm not going to. I'm just telling you, as a young teenage boy, a a kid that that you guys didn't even like, (laughs) Irene, Irene Higuera, a kid that you just did not like. But listen to me. But here, this is why, listen, look at This is why this is important. This is why compassion has to lead us. This is why love has to lead us. Because I was just a kid that was hurting. My my parents loved me. Don't get me wrong. They loved me. And my mom will come up here and tell me that she she probably wishes she could go back and do things differently with me but I was just a kid that was hurting I was lost I was crying for attention I started going in the wrong direction and from 14 to about 24 years old I lived my life however I wanted and from 24 to 25 there was a transition a dark period where 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 I be 
where God began to pull me out of the darkness and bring me into the light. And in that, in that decade, a lot of damage was done. And I know that. And at times I live with that regret and that shame and that pain of letting people down, of hurting people. I know that. You got to understand. You, 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 see me, you see me up here. You, you, like I told you last week, I, I don't like to play games. I tell you the truth. You see me up here at times, and I really do. I really try to live this out. I really try to believe it. I really try to walk in it. But you have to understand that sometimes my truth gets the best of me. And I know what it's like, church, to feel like a failure. I know what it's like to make mistakes that linger with you for years. But until I choose to wake up every day sometimes, you know, that's why God says that his mercies are new every morning, because you're going to need these mercies. You're going to need this grace. You're going to need his forgiveness every single day of your life. That's right. So I got to choose to wake up and receive his new mercies upon my life. Because if I don't, then I'll choose to believe my own truth, not the word of God's truth. And I will never know the real truth. And the real truth will never set me free. The real truth will never set you free. Until you change your truth and receive the truth that is the word of God, you'll always live in your truth. And so this is how we change our truth. Romans 12, 2. And let me just say something real quick. Let me add this in. If you didn't get a chance um, to watch midweek a couple weeks ago brother lewis taught on this scripture and i would encourage you to go back and watch that midweek service and it's a lot more in depth than what i'm about to break down but i'm going to tell you how we change our truth romans 12 2 out of the new living translation says this it says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let god transform you let me say that one more time Amen. but let god transform you into what into a new person let me say that one more time into a new person you see you see pastor eric has to wake up every morning and say god you've been changing me for the last 10 years 20 years whatever it's been now 15 years you've been changing me and I got to wake up and I got to receive your mercies that are new every morning. And I believe that I'm being transformed by your word. I'm not going to copy the behavior of this world. I'm not going to be like this world. But instead, I'm going to let your word transform me into the new person that you want me to be. Listen, by changing the way I think. Amen. If I continue to think about all that has gone wrong in my life, then the truth will never set me free. I'll be held in what we would know in the church realm as spiritual bondage, almost imprisoned. And until I begin to transform my life through the word of God, I'll never be the new person until I change the way I think. The latter part of that scripture goes on to say, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Until God's word becomes your truth, church, you'll keep believing the lies of the enemy. You'll keep believing that, that you're never going to change and it's never going to get better and you're still that same person and all those mistakes that, that you made or they made or whatever, like those things, those are still going to be there, going to linger for it. It doesn't have to be that way. Do you understand, my brother and sister? Like, I don't have to keep going back in that direction. Now, hear me out. I don't go back in that direction as much as I used to, but there's still times. There are still times when the enemy comes in and begins to tell me the lies. There's still times where I feel like I'm not good enough. There's still times where I feel like I know I'm damaged goods. There's still times where I'm wondering, like, God, why do you even want me? Why do you even want to use me? Like, you've, you've seen everything. Oh, but for the grace of God. Amen. The devil is a liar. Change your truth. And my last point, church, 
And my last point. New life, new identity. Come on, church. God promises us a new life. And in that life, we get, listen, this is great. We get to change our identity. The Bible says that when we come to him, you know what's good about it? Is that the Bible says that when we come to God, and when we ask God to forgive us, and when we repent of our sins, the scripture tells us that he remembers our sins no more. That's good, huh, Paul? That's great news. The fact that, 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 that the God that knows all your business, <laughs> whether it was last night, last year, or 10 years ago, the fact that God knows all your business, the moment that you genuinely, sincerely, with authenticity in your heart, go to God and tell God, God, I don't want to live like this anymore. God, I want to change. God, I'm asking you right now to forgive me. I don't want my past to linger. I don't want all my stakes, my failures. I don't want that to be brought up. I don't want the enemy to come in and tell me the lies. It's not because, it's not because they're not facts that they didn't happen, but that's not who I am anymore. New life, new identity. Amen. God says, I, I, I call you my son and my daughter. I'm adopting you into my family. And so now what I'm doing, God's saying, is that I'm changing your identity. Now, this is how identity works. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 out of the ESV, it says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So, this is how our life works right now. When you come to Jesus, your identity has to move from you and what you used to be about to you in Christ. Now here's why this is important. Because before Jesus, before Jesus, you found your identity in all these different things. Positions, titles, even us church folk. Ministry, status, right? Work. Let me say that one more time. Work. You found your identity in your work. Oh, the, the next one's worse. Money. <laughs> we found our identity in the money that we have. The house that we live in. The cars that we drive. Our hobbies our friendships, our boyfriend, our girlfriend, our husband, our wife. Now, are any of these things bad outside? Are they bad? Just in general? No, that's the answer. They're not bad. But when we choose our identity and to identify who we are, in the things that are outside of this circle, that's when it becomes bad and dangerous. Why? If you were here two years ago, this, we talked about this. Why? Because at any moment, any of these things can fail you. Right? So, so my identity is in my wife. My wife, Jessica. Okay? Now, God forbid anything go wrong in our marriage. But if something did go wrong, whether it be between us, whether it be in tragedy, by the grace of God, I don't believe that will happen. But if something did, and all my hope and all my, everything that I've ever wished for and loved was in my wife. And let me just say something. I love my wife very much. She's my wife. I love her a lot. But if something went wrong, oh yeah, I'd be crushed. But if my identity was only in her and something went wrong, then I would lose who I am. If my identity was in my job and I lost my job, then I would lose who I am. What else can we identify with? Um, not just things or people, but what about shame? How about shame? 
You see, some of you have been carrying around shame for a really long time, and you're still identifying yourself with the shame of your past. You're still identifying yourself with failure and regret. You're still identifying yourself with your mistakes and your past. You're still trying to say, well, that's, that's, that's still a part of me. That's who I am. And maybe that's true, but that doesn't have to be true when it comes to your relationship with God. Do I need to read it again? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All the old has passed. Therefore, you have become new. New life, new identity. Man, I know, I know, I feel like some of us, man, we're, we're, we're scarred, we're scarred from the past couple years, right? It's weird. Man, everything that happens is weird. It's still weird, man. I, I feel I'm like our kids and school and just us and it's confusing, right? We struggle. We don't know what to believe sometimes, but we know something's going on. We, we could, we could get so caught up into this that this becomes our identity, the pandemic becomes your identity. I don't want the pandemic to become my identity. Now, outside of this are all the things that we struggle with, that we deal with. But, but, but listen, this is the good news. New life, new identity. When you choose to put your identity in Jesus... When you choose to follow Christ, when you choose to say, I am who God says that I am. I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am the child of God. I'm chosen. God chose me. I'm, the, I'm, I, I'm who God says that I am, right? And because Jesus says that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's go back to last week. Because God says, I never changed my mind about you. I never stopped loving you. I'm always going to be there for you. So no matter what happens in your life, no matter what goes wrong, I am going to be solidified in who I am in Christ. All these things can fail around me. But if I stay right here, I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm protected. I know who I am. I know who my God is. Are you tracking with me, church? I may be damaged goods, but let me tell you something about damaged goods. All throughout the scripture, God uses people that were damaged goods. Man, Jesus' whole team was a bunch of dudes that were all jacked up. So like, like you hear me out? So you got to tell yourself, Silvia Munoz, that I'm still good. Like God can still use me. I know I've been through a lot of my life, but God, you still got a plan for me. You still got a purpose for me. There's still good that you have for me. My life is not over. Just because of what I've experienced in my past, I don't have to identify as that person anymore. I identify who God calls me to be, who he's chosen me to be. That's why it's so important to humble yourself. James chapter 4 verse 10 out of the Amplified says, humble yourselves. I like what the Amplified says. It, it, it brings a little bit more clarity to us. Humble yourself with an attitude of repentance, listen, and insignificance. Now I like this because God is saying, look, don't think too highly of yourselves. Let me give you purpose. In the presence of the Lord, when you humble yourself, in the presence of the Lord, listen, God will exalt you. See, you don't have to, this is what's good about Jesus, is that I don't have to worry about my status because my God will exalt me. I don't got to worry about what people think about me, the way they see me. I just need to stay focused and put my identity in Jesus. He will exalt you. He will lift you up. Listen, he will give you purpose. So humble yourself. Listen, and there's another reason why Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, this is why it's important to guard your heart. When you guard your heart, you're not just guarding it from like sin and temptation. You're guarding it from all the things that want to take your identity. Gosh, man, I know, I know. Have you ever read those stories like about uh, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, athletes? That when it was all said and done, they didn't know what to do. Like I was done playing football and I just had no more purpose. I didn't know what to do. I won the gold medal in the Olympics and then um, I retired and, and I just, I lost sight of who I was. I didn't know what to do. You get what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about right here. But when you remain in Jesus, God never changes who he says you are or who he's called you to be. You humble yourself before him. He exalts you. He gives you purpose. 
And then Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So I, I got I to gotta guard my heart from what this world is trying to teach me, indoctrinate me with. I got to guard my heart from sin and temptation. And then I got to guard my heart from not allowing my identity to get caught up in all the things that it could get caught up in. These are all good things, all good things. My, your grandkids, your kids, your wife, husband, boy, uh, girlfriend. Well, girlfriend, boyfriend, I, that's for another series. We'll get there later. But girlfriend, boy, friendships, hobbies, cars, houses, money, work status, ministry, titles, positions, right? Those are all good things. Not bad things, but I don't want my identity to be in those things. I want, I want my identity to be in Jesus. Now the things, my past, my mistakes, my regret, failure, and shame, those are all things that are bad. I definitely don't want, want my identity to be in those things. When you're in Jesus, he gives you a new life and a new identity. But listen, but it's up to you to walk in that. It's up to you to move past your past. It's up to you to stop putting everything in people, in jobs, in work, in money, in status. It's, it's, it's up to you to get out of that way of thinking. It's up to you. And allow God. Let me say that one more time. And allow God to lead and guide your life. The devil is a liar. Let me say that one more time. The devil is a liar. Change your truth. Change your truth. God will give you a new life and a new identity. Amen. Would you stand with me, church? That's a good word, yeah. That's a good word. So look, <laughs> that's okay, okay? At times you might feel like you're damaged goods. But, 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 but I know we look at that screen and we're like, oh, the glass is broken. It looks all messed up. But that's okay. Let, let's just be real. When we when we come to know Jesus or some of us that have, when we came to know Christ, that's exactly what we were, broken. And God has been putting us back together, piece by piece, restoring us and making us whole. This is a process, my brother and sister. This is, a, this is not an overnight success sensation where, man, everything is just like some of my older generation says, hunky-dory. Peachy, running through the tulips, right? Whatever. It's not like, it, we know that already. We got to battle it out. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle, spiritual warfare. But I want to encourage you. God loves you. God's never going to stop loving you. It don't matter what you've been through, what you've gone through in your life. God can turn things around. God can change things in your life. But you got to believe who Jesus, what Jesus says about you. New life, new identity. Amen. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. Man, if you're in this place this morning, and you're in that place, man, Pastor Eric, that, that's me. I'm, I'm damaged goods. I'm damaged goods. I, I, I didn't know that God loved me so much that that he gives me a new life and a new identity. I, you know, I, as I look at what you were had on the board, as I looked what you had on the screen, I, I, that's me, man. I, I've put my identity in other things. And then when something went wrong, I was let down. When that relationship failed, I was let down. I didn't even realize that, I was, that my identity was in that. When the money ran out, when the job changed or whatever, but I want my identity to be in, G identity to be in Jesus. You don't have to raise your hand, but if that's you, you know who you are. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If you want to make Jesus the true Lord of your life, if you believe, man, in the beginning, God looked at everything and he said, man, everything that I created was very good, but then sin entered. The fall of man, our sin nature. I know we struggle at times, but God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for you and I. On the third day, he was resurrected, and it's his resurrecting power that proves that he is the son of God. And now God is saying, look, all you got to do is this. Listen, all you got to do is believe. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. You will be a new creation in Christ. All the old will pass, and behold, you are brand new. If you want that, then would you say this prayer with me? Believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth. 
Would you say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for being raised on the third day. Proving that you are the Son of God. That you are the Savior of the world. So God, I ask you right now to forgive me of all my sin, all my wrong, my past, every mistake, every failure, God. I ask you to forgive me. Help me move forward. I receive you as my Lord and Savior, God. Now, Lord, help me walk into this new life. Create in me, God, a new identity. I know I may have been damaged goods, but God, you use those that are damaged and you repair them. You rebuild them. You restore them. So restore me, God. Restore my heart. I want my identity to be found in you. There's security in that. There's safety and protection. I don't have to trust in a person, a job or money. I can trust in you. I can make the changes that I need to make. And I can be who you want me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. Wow. Praise the Lord. Coming into the latter end of the year, right? Are you ready for it? Amen. Praise the Lord. I know you're ready for fall. And I know you're ready for the cooler weather. Amen. We've had some good days so far. Amen. I'm not too, too bad. So we're, we'll get there, right? Amen. So I just want to say welcome to all of you here at HD Church. Those of you that are online, we just want to welcome you. Say thank you for joining in. Thank you for being a part of what God's doing here at this church. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, we have some great things coming up. You'll hear in our announcements. Um, there is one thing that will be starting this Tuesday, um, and that is our Bible school. And if you have any questions on that, you could see Jason Gutierrez back there. Right, wave your hand. He's back there, one of our ushers in security. So you could see him if you have any questions. I know that um, the Bible school does a lot of good. It instills in you the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How can you go wrong? <laughs> Amen. So uh, just see Jason, and he can give you all the details. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And ladies, don't forget our upcoming meeting next month. Uh, it's going to be good. Amen. It's going to be good. Also, um, we are having a very special guest at the end of the month. And I just want to put that out to you. It's going to be on our announcements next week, but let me just put it out to you today. Uh, Brother Richard Roberts, um, I don't know if you, some of you may know him. I know I know him, but some of you that are a little bit younger might think, I don't know him. Um, old time preacher, Oral Roberts, Oral Roberts University. Any bells are ringing right now? <laughs> that His son is Richard Roberts, and he's going to be our guest um, at the end of the month. So, I, guys, I just want you to be ready. Amen. He's a wonderful man of God, very experienced and knowledgeable in, in just the things that he's been in ministry all of his life. And uh, I'm just excited to what he, what he has for us. Amen. Amen. So make sure you're here. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to give? So today, I just want you to know that we are receiving our morning's tithes and offerings, but we are going to receive a second offering, and all of that is going to toward the installation of our playground. So as we speak, they are working on it, getting it ready, and so now we have to get the grounds ready for them to install it. How many of you are excited? Amen. I'm excited of how it's all going to look. And, and we are working on our outer building. Don't worry. We're going to get that done too. And man, we're just going to have a brand new look. How many of you know that that's okay? 
It's okay. Amen. It's okay to have a nice look, right? You guys do that to your homes, right? You're out there doing all kinds of things. Am I right? Right, Dee? Thank you, Dee. You're, you're, you're cheering me on back there. I'm not sure where Bobby is. Bob, there's okay, Bobby. Just want to make sure I have a couple of you. Uh, but I think it's going to look fantastic. Amen. Is that about, is that's a good word, right? Fantastic. Awesome. Beautiful. Awesome. Gorgeous. Praise God. I think the house of God should. Amen. Amen. So prepare your hearts after Pastor Eric preaches us a good message. He'll receive the second offering. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. So just a quick uh, couple of scriptures. I know you know Philippians chapter 4. I know you know about the Apostle Paul giving thanks to the, the Philippian church for their support. And he says in verse 10, four, chapter 4, verse 10, my heart overflows with joy when I think of how you have demonstrated love to me by your financial support of this ministry. Amen. That's what you're doing. You are demonstrating love for your church. I know you're giving to God. I know you're, you're, you're honoring him, but you're showing love to where you come and you want our house to look nice. Amen. I believe that. And so he's even for, even though you have so little, you still continue to help me at every moment and every opportunity. And I, I think back of when we were closed that whole year, I just think how faithful you were. Even though we didn't get to gather, even though we didn't get to come in, man, you guys were awesome and you were so faithful and you have no idea how um, thankful we are for your faithfulness. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across. Amen. And he says, I'm not telling you this because I'm in need for I have learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things. I love the Apostle Paul. I, I, I think that when we all get to heaven, he's going to be the one person other than God and Jesus, I know. But just, I mean, just, he, he just was so turned around in his life and so touched by God and just began to find out who God was and just learned of who he was in God. I just love that. He goes, I, I, I'm trained. I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Church, if we could just get that secret, amen? For um, whether in fullness or in hunger, I find that the strength of Christ explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty you're so gracious you have so graciously provided for my essential needs during this season of difficulty for i want you to know that the philippian church was the only church that supported me in the beginning as i went out to preach the gospel you um, were the only church that sowed into my and to me financially. When I was in Thessalonica, that's a good one, you uh, supported me well for well over a year. I mention this not because I'm requesting a gift, but that fruit. So that fruit. And that's what we do, church. That's why we, we honor God. That's why we receive a tithe and an offering. That's why we share with you the importance of it. Not for our own, but because it opens a door for you. Amen. So that fruit may abound to your account. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm requesting a gift, but so that fruit of your generosity may bring you an abundant reward. Amen. Amen. We all look for that, right? Amen. So I'm encouraging you. Get behind this. Bring your tithe, bring your offering. At the end of this service, sow a seed so that we can continue the work here. Amen. Amen. All right. Ushers, if you would minister to the people. Hallelujah. Stretch your hands out. Father, we just honor you and we just praise you for this wonderful opportunity. 
We just love you, Jesus, for who you are and what you have done in our hearts and in our lives, how you brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, how we were once dead but now made alive because of the great power that works within us, God. I just thank you for that. I thank you for teaching us, God, t t teaching through your word how to live an overcoming life like the Apostle Paul, Father. I just thank you for that, God. I thank you for every person that has given their tithe and their offering that you continue to open the windows of heaven continue to bless them like never before jesus continue father god to bring them in every area of their life right where they need to be with you and we praise you and honor you in jesus name amen